Hello, everyone, and welcome to BookerCast, the podcast where books come to life. And I'm so excited to dive into another amazing story with all of you. Whether you're a bookworm or just love a good story, this is the place for you. Every episode, we explore incredible books, talk about their stories and characters, and share insights that'll make you fall in love with reading all over again. All right, let's not keep you waiting any longer. Get comfortable, and let's jump right into it. Sounds good. Welcome to another deep dive. We're cracking open Sean Carroll's Quanta in Fields. Oh, this is a good one. It's like uh, a sequel to his book on classical mechanics, but this time we're going full quantum. Yeah. It's quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, but he makes it surprisingly accessible. You know, for someone who doesn't have a PhD in physics, he really breaks it down. He really does. And I love how he sets it up. Like, he starts by talking about this crisis in physics. Right. Like a total meltdown of what they thought they knew. Exactly. They were yeah. trying to figure out this thing called black body radiation. It seems simple enough, right? Like, how much light does a hot object give off? But mm -hmm. classical physics just... It broke down. Yeah, their predictions were like, the intensity should just keep going up forever at high frequencies. Which obviously isn't true. You know, things don't just glow infinitely bright. So physicists were stumped, right? Like, what do you do when your entire framework just doesn't work? Well, this is where Max Planck comes in. Max Planck, the quantum hero. Haha, uh -huh, yeah. And he had this radical idea that energy, it couldn't just be exchanged continuously. It had to be in these little packets. Like little bundles of energy. Yeah. He called them quanta. And it was a wild idea at the time. I mean, it changes everything, right? It really does. It's like saying you can only buy things in dollar increments, no sense allowed. So no more smooth, continuous energy flow. Nope. It's all chunky now. And the crazy thing is, Planck's formula with these quanta, it perfectly explained the black body spectrum. So it worked, but it must have been a huge conceptual leap for physicists at the time. Oh, absolutely. It was a revolution. And then Einstein comes along and he's like, wait, I could take this even further. Right. Einstein was like, hold my beer. And he applied this quantization idea to light itself. So light, which we always thought of as a wave, is also made up of these little packets of energy. Yeah. We call them photons now, and it explained the photoelectric effect, this thing where light can knock electrons off a metal surface. So that was a big deal, right? Yeah. It showed that light can act like a particle, not just a wave. Yeah, suddenly this wave-particle duality idea was starting to gain real traction. But how did all of this lead to a new understanding of the atom? Well, at the time, the best model of the atom was Rutherford's model. Where the electrons orbit the nucleus like planets around the sun. Exactly. But there was a huge problem with that. According to classical physics, those electrons should be constantly radiating energy, losing energy, and spiraling into the nucleus. Yeah, like in a fraction of a second, right? Yeah. But obviously, atoms are stable. We're made of atoms, so something wasn't adding up. Another crisis in physics. It seems like physics was having a lot of crises back then. Huh. Yeah. There was a lot of head scratching going on, and that's when Niels Bohr stepped in. Niels Bohr, another quantum hero. He came up with this model. It was strange, but it worked. He said electrons could only exist in specific orbits around the nucleus. N not just any orbit, only certain allowed ones. Right. And these orbits, they were quantized. Meaning they could only have certain discrete energy levels. Exactly. And electrons could jump between these orbits by absorbing or emitting photons. So it was like a quantum staircase for electrons. A great analogy. But the question remained, why were these orbits quantized? Huh. It felt a bit arbitrary. Like, why those specific orbits and not others? And this is where Louis de Broglie steps in. He's like, what if electrons aren't just particles? Wait, what else could they be? It was like, what if particles can act like waves, too? You know, just like light. Mind-blowing. But how would that explain the quantized orbits? Think of a guitar string. Okay. You can only have certain notes on a guitar string because the waves have to fit perfectly within the length of the string. Yeah, it's like a resonance thing. Exactly. And de Broglie proposed that the same thing happens with electrons in an atom. The only allowed orbits are the ones where the electron's wavelength fits a whole number of times around the nucleus. So it's like the electron is resonating around the nucleus. Yeah. It was a brilliant insight. It finally gave a deeper explanation for Bohr's model. And it paved the way for the wave function, right? This central concept in quantum mechanics. Absolutely. This is where things start to get really interesting. So what exactly is this wave function? Can you explain it in a way that even I can understand? Okay, imagine, instead of knowing exactly where a particle is and how fast it's moving, we have this wave function. It's a mathematical description. 
it tells us the probabilities of finding the particle in different places. So it's not a definite location, but a cloud of possibilities. Exactly. It's like a map of potential, a blurry picture of where the particle might be. And this blurriness isn't just because we don't know enough. It's fundamental to the quantum world. Right. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle coming into play. Ah, yes. The principle that says we can't know both the position and momentum of a particle with perfect accuracy. Yeah, the more you try to pin down one, the fuzzier the other gets. It's a trade-off. So we're basically saying that the world is inherently uncertain at the quantum level. That's one of the biggest lessons of quantum mechanics, and it's a tough one to swallow because it goes against our everyday intuition. We like our world to be predictable. Uh-huh, yeah. But the quantum world plays by a different set of rules. And who would thought that trying to figure out the light from a hot object would lead to all of this? It's amazing, right, how one simple question can unravel our entire understanding of reality. I'm already feeling my brain stretching, but I'm yeah. definitely ready for more. This wave function idea, it's got to have some crazy consequences, right? Oh, absolutely. Wait till we get to the double slit experiment. That's where things get really wild. Can't wait. <laughs> okay, so we've talked about wave functions and uncertainty. Yeah, and how the quantum world is inherently fuzzy. Right. So how does all of this play out in experiments? Well, there's this classic experiment. It's called the double slit experiment. Oh, yeah. I remember this one from school. It always seemed like a magic trick. It really does. It shows the wave particle duality of matter in a really mind bending way. OK, so remind me, how does it work again? So you have two slits and you shine a beam of light through them. And you get an interference pattern on a screen behind the slits. Right? Exactly. Like waves of light passing through both slits and interfering with each other. Yeah, I remember seeing those bright and dark bands. Now, here's the crazy part. You do the same thing with electrons, but you fire them one at a time. One at a time. So each electron is like a tiny particle, right? That's what we think, right. But guess what? You still get an interference pattern. Wait, what? How can that be? If each electron is going through one slit or the other, how can it interfere with itself? That's the million dollar question, and it really challenges our classical intuition. Yeah, in the classical world, things have definite trajectories. Right, like billiard balls bouncing around, we know where they are and where they're going. But in the quantum world, it's different. Yeah, until we actually measure the electron's position, it doesn't have a definite path. So it's like it's going through both slits at the same time. That's basically what the wave function tells us. The electron's wave function is spread out, it passes through both slits, and then it interferes with itself. Exactly. And that's why we see the interference pattern, even though we're firing electrons one at a time. But then if we try to measure which slit the electron goes through, what happens? Well, that's when the wave function collapses. It's like the electron suddenly decides, OK, I'm going to go through this slit. Right. And the interference pattern disappears. So it's like our observation is affecting the outcome of the experiment. That's one way to interpret it. And it's led to a lot of debate about the role of the observer in quantum mechanics. I mean, it's a bit unsettling to think that just by looking at something, we might be changing its behavior. I know it's mind boggling, but that's the weird and wonderful world of quantum mechanics. So what does the wave function actually represent? Is it a real physical wave or just a mathematical tool? That's a great question. And there are different interpretations of quantum mechanics that try to answer that. Does Carroll talk about these different interpretations in his book? He does, yeah. He covers the Copenhagen interpretation, the many worlds interpretation. I've heard of those, but I don't fully understand them. Yeah, they're pretty heady stuff, but Carroll does a good job of explaining them in a way that's accessible. It's fascinating, though, right, that there's still so much we don't know about the nature of reality. Absolutely. And that's what makes quantum mechanics so exciting. It's still full of mysteries. OK, so we've seen how these quantum concepts lead to some pretty strange results and experiments. And we've touched on some of the different ways of interpreting what's going on. Now, I'm curious to see how we can build on these ideas to develop a deeper understanding of the universe. Well, that's where quantum field theory comes in. Ah, yes. QFT. The marriage of quantum mechanics and special relativity. Exactly. It's a framework that allows us to describe the behavior of particles and forces at incredibly high energies and small scales. OK, I'm ready for another mind bending journey. Can you give me a preview of what QFT is all about? Well, one of the key shifts in thinking is that instead of thinking about particles as tiny, solid objects, we start thinking about them as excitations of fields. Yeah, it's like the field is the ocean and the particles are the waves. So it's not that particles are popping in and out of existence. It's that the fields themselves are constantly changing and fluctuating. Exactly. And those fluctuations, those ripples in the field, 
Those are what we perceive as particles. Okay, I think I'm starting to get a glimpse of this. It's a big shift in perspective, but it's a powerful one. I'm guessing it leads to some pretty profound consequences. Oh, absolutely. We'll delve into those next. All right, so we've journeyed through quantum mechanics, explored this bizarre world of wave functions and uncertainty. Yeah, and then we took it a step further. We dove into quantum field theory, where everything's all about fields and their excitations. Right, fields is the fundamental stuff of the universe. Pretty mind-blowing stuff. And it leads to some really incredible consequences, like, has he ever thought about how forces work? Well, yeah. I mean, we we learned about the four fundamental forces in school gravity, electromagnetism, strong force, weak force. Right. But one of the biggest triumphs of quantum field theory is this idea of unification of forces. Unification. Like combining them. Yeah. It's like, imagine you thought ice, water, and steam were totally different things. So then you realize, nope, it's all just H2O in different forms. Exactly. So in quantum field theory, it turns out that electromagnetism and the weak force are actually two sides of the same coin. So at some level, they merge into one. At high enough energies, they become the electroweak force. That's incredible. So it's not four fundamental forces. It's more like three. Yeah. And this unification, it's not just a theoretical idea. It's been experimentally confirmed. Really? How did they do that? They discovered the W and Z bosons, the particles that carry the weak force, and their properties perfectly matched the predictions of the electroweak theory. That's amazing. So what about gravity and the strong force? Do they fit into this picture too? That's the million dollar question. A grand unified theory, a theory of everything, that's the holy grail of physics. And so far, no luck. Well, we have a fantastic theory of gravity, Einstein's general relativity, but it's a classical theory, not a quantum one. And we have a great quantum field theory for the strong force, quantum chromodynamics, but it doesn't quite mesh with general relativity. Oh, so yeah. the search continues. Oh, yeah. The quest for unification goes on. But speaking of mysteries, there's this other thing that always fascinates me. Antimatter. Antimatter, yeah. Yeah. Like matter's evil twin. Ha uh ha. -huh. In a way, every particle has an antiparticle. Same mass, but opposite charge. So for every electron, there's a positron. For every proton, an antiproton. Exactly. And when a particle and its antiparticle meet, they annihilate each other. Pure energy. Wow. So where does all this antimatter come from? Well, according to the Big Bang Theory, the universe should have started with equal amounts of matter and antimatter. But that's not what we see, right? Mm -hmm. We're made of matter. The planets are matter. Yep. Everything we see is matter. Right. And that's the puzzle. There must have been a tiny imbalance, a slight excess of matter over antimatter in the early universe. And that tiny excess is what we're made of. It's pretty wild, isn't it? Our very existence depends on this cosmic imbalance. Makes you wonder what would have happened if antimatter had won out. A whole different universe, that's for sure. But I think one of the biggest takeaways from all of this is just how far we've come in our understanding of the universe. From classical physics to quantum mechanics to quantum field theory. We've gone from thinking the atom was the smallest thing to discovering a whole zoo of subatomic particles. And realizing that fields are the fundamental stuff of reality. It's a journey that's full of mind-bending concepts, but it's also incredibly awe-inspiring. Yeah, and I think Carol's book does a fantastic job of capturing that sense of awe. He doesn't shy away from the complexity, but he explains it in a way that makes it understandable and even exciting. And he reminds us that science is not just about finding answers, it's about asking questions, mm -hmm. embracing the unknown. Exactly. It's about that constant curiosity, that drive to understand the world around us, no matter how strange or counterintuitive it might seem. Well, on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this deep dive. Yeah, we've covered a lot of ground today, from black body radiation to the unification of forces to the mysteries of antimatter. We've really explored some of the biggest ideas in the universe. Thanks to Sean Carroll for guiding us on this incredible journey, and thanks to all of you for listening. If you're hungry for more, definitely check out Carol's book, Quanta and Fields. It's a real treat. And if you have any questions or thoughts, feel free to reach out to us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. Keep those brains buzzing, keep exploring, and we'll catch you on the next Deep Dive. And that's a wrap for today's episode of BookerCast. We hope you enjoyed diving into it as much as we did. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to hear your thoughts on this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit that like button, and share this episode with your fellow book lovers. And let us know your thoughts in the comments below. We love hearing from you. See you in the next deep dive. Bye for now, and happy reading.